Last Sunday we talked about John Wycliffe and uh, what he believed his translation of the Bible into English being the first one from the Latin Vulgate. Now this week we're going to look at John Huss. And I'm just going to warn you about a couple things right off the bat. First of all, I'm getting over a little something, so if my voice all of a sudden cracks or something, you feel free to laugh, but understand that and that's what's going on. <clears throat> so, the other thing is, every, every source that I read spelled John Huss's name wrong. Or not wrong, but differently. Okay? Some spelled it like this. J-O-H-N-H-U-S. Some spelled it J-O-N-H-U-S. Some spelled it J-O-H-N-H-S or U-S-S. Okay? Some spelled it like this. J A N H S. So you're going to see it spelled. What I decided to do was just spell it however the source I was using spelled it. Okay? So his name is going to be spelled different throughout the. Um, unless. Did she change it? No. I guess Sylvia changed it when she, she. I sent this to her and she. I think she made it all H U S. Okay, so if you. That's fine. If you look at any of the literature, though, um, you will not see a common consensus at all on how to spell his name. Okay? But, alright. So, today we're going to look at John Huss and the Bohemian Brother. Who was John Huss? to be the first point. Okay? Wycliffe's words quickly traveled beyond England, crisscrossing Europe. Around 1400, his ideas began to take root in Bohemia a region in the land now known as the Czech Republic. Roman Catholic bishops in Bohemia banned Wycliffe's writings, but John Huss, a brilliant Bohemian professor and priest, had already embraced Wycliffe's ideas. So the stuff we studied last, that's why we do Wycliffe first, okay? Because Wycliffe's ideas are going to filter across Europe. The loud words are going to be sent out. They're going to go preaching. They're not just going to preach in England. They're also going to preach in other areas. And as we'll see in a second, there's also a political tie between Bohemia and England as far as a royal marriage between the royal families of those two areas. So there's also a direct tie there between those two uh, regions of Europe just because of this marriage that's going to occur that's going to kind of bring those areas together. But Wycliffe's ideas are going to spread across Europe and they're going to take root uh, very deeply in Bohemia. And the primary person that's going to be pro proclaiming the ideas of Wycliffe is going to be John Huss. Okay? Now, there are undoubtedly others, but the one that we're going to focus on is the one that gets most of the attention and the credit for doing that, and that's John Huss. Okay? So, while the message against the Lollers was proceeding in, in another land, Bohemia, the writings of Wycliffe were reinforced in helping to shape the revolt against the Catholic Church, which was accompanied by far more bloodshed than was the attempted expiration of their influence in England. So, if you're looking at, the, the, the short way of saying that is to say this, there's going to be way more persecution, way more bloodshed on a higher level in Bohemia with John Huss over the ideas of John Wycliffe than there were in England, okay? And I think you'll see that by the time we get, by the time we get done with this. Now, last Sunday we talked about how the division in the papacy between the Pope at Avignon and the Pope in Rome, how they, there was that great schism there, and how each one of them excommunicates the other one, and how that actually led to the advantage of Wycliffe as far as saving his own life, uh, because the church had that massive division within it at the same time. Well, that is still going on to some extent while Huss is uh, going to have his career in Bohemia. Okay? Um, Bruce Shelley the author of Church History and Plain Language offers insight into the historical connection between England and Bohemia, and by extension, Wycliffe and Huss. Shelley states the movement Wycliffe launched continued in England under uh, restrictions, but found an ever greater opportunity for expansion in Bohemia. Here it is. The two nations were linked in 1383 by the marriage of Anne of Bohemia and King Richard III of England. So students of both countries went back and forth between Oxford and Prague. Okay? So this marriage between the princess in Bohemia to the king of England creates a political link 
and students are going to be traveling back and forth from Oxford, where you already know that Wycliffe was a professor, across Europe to Prague. And so there's going to almost be an, uh, almost like a foreign exchange student type, type program there. It's not like official or anything like we would recognize it today, but that's kind of what's going on. So there's a direct connection between these two regions, and there's an exchange of ideas that's occurring between Oxford and Prague. Okay? Now, Wycliffe's revolt... Uh, it's going to be much greater success in Bohemia because it was joined to a strong national party led by Hus. The Czech reformer came from peasant parents in southern Bohemia in the small town of uh, uh, Husovitz, I guess is how you would say that. He studied theology at the University of Prague, earning both a Bachelor of Arts and Master of Arts before beginning his teaching in the Faculty of Arts uh, in the Faculty of Arts and plunging in, and plunging, in plunging into uh, the reform cause. So there's similarities here, folks, just even between Wycliffe and Huss. They both are going to be professors. They both are going to be uh, professors of theology eventually, and they're also going to be preaching on the side. So there are a lot of similarities between Huss and between Wycliffe, even in just uh, their careers and how they, they're basically products of the university, uh, Wycliffe at Oxford and, and Huss in Prague. And so there are going to be a lot of things that are, are very similar between them. Okay? Speaking of John Huss, Andrew Miller writes, John of uh, uh, Huss events, a village near the Bohemian frontier, he was born about the year 1369. Now this is important. So that he must have been about 15 years of age when, he, when his admired and acknowledged teacher, the venerable Wycliffe, died. Okay? So John Huss is about 15, 16 years old in Bohemia when Wycliffe dies in England. Okay, so he's about the age where you get at the time you'd be getting ready to enter into the university. Okay, so he's he's about 15 years old. Huss is when Wycliffe dies. Okay, so he's going to go off to the university. Miller offers the following biographical information regarding the unique personage of John Huss. Miller states he was tall, slender, with a thoughtful countenance, gentle, friendly, and accessible to all. His talents being of a high order, he was sent to the University of Prague with the view of studying for the church. Here, he distinguished himself by his extensive attainments as a scholar. He advanced rapidly in the church and university performance and was made, and was made confessor to, the queen, to, to queen Sophia. Okay? So he is going to, like Wycliffe, be recognized for the talent that he had, and he's going to advance at first within that system there, both at the university and in the Catholic Church at first, okay? To the point where when the queen is going to make confession, she's going to confess to who? To Huss, okay? So understand that those, those points. Loretta, Loretta informs us that in 1402 he became rector and preacher in the Chapel of Holy Innocence of Bethlehem in Prague. In that post, by his eloquence and earnestness, he attracted all classes from the highest to the lowest, and speedily became one of the most influential men in the country. By 1403, when he was uh, at most in his early 30s, or perhaps younger, he was ordained to the priesthood. So he actually becomes a Catholic priest. Okay, um, And eventually, he was the dean of the Faculty of Philosophy and rector of the University of Prague. Okay? So again, much like Wycliffe, Huss is having similar attainments, similar advancements uh, through the university and then also outside of the university within uh, the general population of, of uh, Bohemia. Any questions about the biographical information about who Huss was before we move on? So I, I hope that you see that there are similarities here between these two guys. Okay, now... Huss is influenced by Wycliffe. Whether through Oxford or other channels, the writings of Wycliffe were being read in Prague, okay, at least as early as the 1380s. Presumably, Huss knew of them in his student days, okay? Now that's according to Lorette. Shelley concurs with Lorette on this point, saying, uh, his student days introduced Huss to the philosophical writings of Wycliffe, but only after his ordination and appointment as a rector and preacher at Bethlehem Chapel 
did he come upon Wycliffe's religious writings. He adopted at once the English reformers' views of the church as an elect company with Christ, not the Pope, its true head. Okay? So the idea here is this that while Wycliffe's a student, well, I'm sorry, while Huss is a student, he becomes introduced to the more philosophical, legal writings of Wycliffe that we talked about last week. Okay? Then as he progresses, and he, after he's ordained and he becomes the rector of the church there in Prague, that he becomes aware of his theological writings about the church, about the Bible, about uh, a lot of the doctrines that we went through and studied last, last Sunday. Okay? Once he is aware and he studied them out, he seems to make an abrupt change of mind in favor of Wycliffe's teachings on the church and salvation and these other things. Okay? But up to that point, you know, he was pretty much thoroughly Catholic. Bethlehem Chapel, near the university, gave Huss an unrivaled opportunity to circulate Wycliffe's teachings, including his criticism of the abuses of power in the papacy. Huss's fiery sermons in the Bohemian language fanned widespread popular support. Soon, there were student riots for and against Wycliffe. Okay? So here's another similarity. When he preaches, he does not preach in Latin. He preaches in the, in the vernacular, in the native tongue of the people. Okay? And he starts to teach and circulate in written form the teachings of John Wycliffe. Now, as you would expect, is this going to create a divide? Okay? It's going to create a divide. People are going to take sides for it and against it. And eventually, it's going to get very tense, and there's going to be riots and struggles, not only in the university, but also in the, the general population of Bohemia. <clears throat> Miller offers some interesting perspective on the careers <clears throat> of the reformers regarding Huss. Miller writes, But like most, if not all, reformers, he had been <coughs> anxious at first to preach against the prevailing abuses than to instruct people in the pure truth of God. Now, I think that's interesting. Okay? What is the focus of these men's early preaching? It's not so much to tell people what's right, as much as it is to tell people what's wrong with the church. Because their primary objective is to reform the what? The church. And I think you'll see this when we study Luther in a, in a few weeks. Luther's he first he what, what is he first posts his ninety five theses or his ninety five objections to what the church is currently doing. Wycliffe kind of does the same thing. So Miller is is recognizing the fact here that there seems to be a trend in the career of these reformers where they start out first by telling people what's drawing attention and calling people's attention to what's wrong with the current church. Okay, let's read the rest of the quote. We are convinced that this has greatly been the case in all kinds of reform, and must account for many of the many scenes of violence in the best of case, best of causes. The people were led first of all through the blessings of God to receive the truth, especially the truth as it is in Jesus. The end would be gained without the mind uh, mind being inflamed by hearing uh, denounced in strong language the vices of the priestly oppressors. So what Miller is saying here is that if he thinks that if they had just taught the truth. That the truth would have um, sort of shown the light on what the lie was and what was wrong without having the effect of stirring everything up to this frenzied pitch where eventually you have riots. Now, I don't know, you know, I'm just sharing this with you, okay? I'm not necessarily saying that this is totally, I totally agree with this, but I think it's an interesting point to consider. He goes on to say the pride, luxury, and licensedness. Of the, of the whole clerical system had become intolerable to mankind, so that to condemn the abuses without touching the doctrines of the church was the high road to popularity. Now, he's, while he does say this, he does support us, okay, calls him one of the great reformers, but I do think that's an interesting point, because you're going to see that with Wycliffe, you, uh, we saw that to some extent with Wycliffe, you see it with us, you're going to see it with Luther, where their first, the first thing they do is, is to point out what's wrong with the church. And then eventually they got to move past that and start teaching what they actually believe where the church is wrong. Does that make sense to you? So anyway, that, that's, that's Miller's take on that. I just share that with you because I thought it was an interesting point. Does anybody have any questions or comments about that? Yeah. Well, I think it's, a, it's, it's part of the nature of man when he found, finds out that you've been duped 
so to speak, is that your first defense against that is to tell everybody, I've been misled all this time, you know, and why is this? And, and then you can get that through and then get down to what's really important, but I think it's part of the human nature to do that. And I think too, and this this actually has prompted me to think about the early uh, dispensational writers of the last century, because one of the things I want to do now is I want to go back and read through some of the early writings to see if if uh, if the early mid Acts Pauline dispensationalists were doing the same thing. And I, I, my my sense is to some extent they were. They're pointing out where the Acts two people or the the uh, the covenant people or wherever were wrong. And then they, over time, moved on to, to sort of explaining themselves in more positive terms why they were right. Um, but I'm still working through that. Um, I'm not prepared to say any more than that at this time, at least regard to that. But I do think it's an interesting point. He became hostile. Did I miss something here? No, he first became... I didn't put that in here though, did I? Okay, apparently I missed a couple in the PowerPoint. I'll have to fix that. He first became, next point in the notes, he first became involved in a university quarrel as to the privileges of the students, and again, his opposition to Gregory um, the, the, the Twelfth gave great offense to the Archbishop of Bohemia. Let's talk about Huss now, who sided with the anti Pope. So again, this is in the time period where you have the schism. And there's an argument in the church over who's the true pope. The pope at Rome or the pope at Avignon, France. Okay? And, and, and Huss says, well, I think it's this guy. And he ticks off the Archbishop of Bohemia by who he chose and so forth. So uh, probation, uh, prohibitory decrees were issued against Huss, who being a favorite of the court and with the people, nothing was done. He was allowed to continue his preaching in the vernacular language. So he definitely is condemned, much like... Wycliffe was. We studied last Sunday how Wycliffe had the protection of influential people within England, and he was never totally silenced. Okay? Early on, Huss had a similar order issued against him, but because he's being protected by certain influential people within society, he's allowed to continue preaching. Okay? For a while. Piecing, next point, piecing together information from Jones and Shelley, more clarity emerges regarding these events. In 1407, the Archbishop of Prague grew restless and complained to the Pope about the spread of Wycliffe's doctrines. The Pope replied, the Pope's reply to Archbishop uh, Zebenek was, simp was simply root out the heresy, for which Huss was excommunicated. Refusing to hush, Huss continued to preach. So he's, he's really, essentially, excommunicated, but no one really follows through with the order of excommunication, and Huss is continuing to preach at least for a while. Okay? And again, next point, now this will be the top here, sorry about that, I need to make a note of that, that I fixed that. Uh, Huss made matters worse when he openly attacked the Pope's sale of indulgences for the support of his war against Naples. So the Pope's going to war, the papal war against Naples, in order to pay for it, and he's selling indulgences. And Huss openly attacks this practice, very interestingly, similar to who was going to? Luther, okay, uh, against this. This move caused Huss the support of his king, uh, Wenceslaus, and when Prague fell under a papal interdict, we talked about what that meant in the past, because of Huss, the reformer left for exile in southern Bohemia. During this period of retirement, Huss drew heavily upon Wycliffe and wrote his major work on the church. Okay, So what really gets him in trouble is when he attacks the sale of indulgences to support this papal war against Naples. Once that happens, the Pope puts all Bohemia under the interdict. Remember what that meant? That meant that no sacraments could be issued in the entire country. Massive pressure is placed on Huss because of this, and he flees into exile or into hiding for a while. And while he's in hiding is when he writes uh, his basically uh, only, only significant book on the, on the church. Philip Schaff agrees with Shelley, calling Huss's on the church the chief product of his time in exile. The chief product of this period of exile was Huss's work on the church, De Ecclesia, in Latin. The most noted of all his writings. It was written 
in view of the national snoid that our synod held against him in 1413 and was sent to Prague and read in Bethlehem Chapel July of uh, uh, July 8th. Of this tract, Cardinal de Lilly said at the uh, Council of, Co of Constance that by any infinite number of arguments, it combated the Pope's plenary authority as such as the Quran, the book of the damned Muhammad, combated the Catholic Church. So he... Where is Huss here, thou, in relation to the church? They're saying Huss is as damned, if you will, as Muhammad and the Quran are to to Islam. It's in their stance to the church. Okay, so basically, they're calling him an outright total heretic. See, I got this backwards. I need to fix this. Sorry about that. Philip Schaub does the best job uh, outlining the key beliefs of Huss and explaining their connection with Wycliffe. Consider the following quotations from Schaub. Now, these are all in your notes, okay? So we're going to work through these. I'm just going to read them, make a couple comments on them, but I want you to see the connection here between Schaub, I'm sorry, between Wycliffe and Huss. In this volume, next to Wycliffe's, the most famous treatment on the church since Cyprian's work, De Ecclesia, and Augustine's writings about the Donatists, Huss defined the church and the power of the keys, and then proceeds to, defi to defend himself against the formulations of Alexander V and John the Twenty-Third, and to answer the Prague theologians, uh, Stefan Platz and that other whoever that other guy is, who uh, deserted him. The following are some of his leading positions: the Holy Catholic Church is the body or congregation of all predestinated the dead, the living, and those yet to be. Now you can see a heavily influence of Augustine there in the idea of predestination. The term Catholic means universal. The unity of the church is a unity of predestination and blessedness, a unity of faith, charity, and grace. The Roman pontiff and the cardinals are not the church. The church can exist without cardinals and a pope, and in fact, for hundreds of years, there were no cardinals. As, as for the position Christ assigned to Peter, Huss affirmed that Christ called himself the rock and that the church is founded on him by virtue of predestination. In view of Peter's clear and positive confession, the rock, Petra, said unto Peter, Petro, I say unto thee, thou art Peter. That is a confessor of the true rock, which rock I am. And upon the rock that is myself, I will build this church. Thus Huss placed himself firmly on the ground taken by Augustine. Peter never was the head of the Holy Catholic Church. So does Huss reject the papacy? Does he reject the cardinals? Does he reject that whole system? Okay, next point. Huss set himself clearly against the whole, whole um, ultra monte theory of the church and its head. The Roman bishop, he said, was... was, was on, I'm sorry, an equality with other bishops until Constantine made him Pope. It was then that he became began to usurp authority. Through ignorance and the love of money, the Pope may err, and has erred, and to rebel against an erring Pope is to obey Christ. There may, there may have been depraved and heretical Popes. Now, all of that is just totally not acceptable if you're a Catholic at this time, okay? Especially if you're favoring the papacy. In the second part of the Ecclesia, Huss pronounced the bulls of Alexander and John uh, the Twenty-Third anti-Christian and therefore not to be obeyed. Alexander's bull prohibiting preaching in Bohemia except in the cathedral, parish, or monastic churches was against the gospel. For Christ preached in homes, on the seaside, and in synagogues, and bade his disciples to go into all the world and preach. No papal excommunication may be uh, in, uh, may be an impediment to doing what Christ did and taught to be done. So is he just thumbing his nose at this whole thing? Okay, he's saying you can't. I'm not going to listen to that because Christ did it, and so I'm going to do what Christ did. I don't care what the Pope says because the Pope is wrong. Turning to the Pope's right to issue indulgences, the reformer went over the ground that he had already traversed in his replies to John's two, two bulls calling for a crusade against... Um, this guy here, this guy's name starts with an L. He's the king of Naples, by the way. Okay. He denied the Pope's right to go to war and to make appeal to the secular sword. If John was minded to follow Christ, he should, pray, he should 
pray for his enemies and say, My kingdom is not of this world. Then the promised wisdom, wisdom would be given, which no enemies would be able to gainsay. The power to forgive sins belongs not to mortal man any more than it belonged to the priest to whom Christ sent the lepers. The lepers were cleansed before they reached the priest. Indeed, many popes who conceded the most ample indulgences were themselves damned. Confessions of the heart alone is sufficient for the soul's salvation uh, were, the ap were, were the applicants truly penitent. So, again, like Wycliffe, does he totally get rid of everything Catholic? No, but is he denouncing the majority of it? I think you've got to say yes. Last point, in denying the infallibility of the, of the Pope and the Church visible, and in setting aside the sacramental power of the priesthood to open and shut the kingdom of heaven, Huff broke with the accepted theory of Western Christendom. He committed the unpardonable sin of the Middle Ages. These fundamental ide ideas, however, were not original to the Bohemian reformer. He took them out of Wycliffe's writings. He also incorporated whole paragraphs of these writings in his pages. Teachers never had a more developed pupil than the English reformer had in Huss. Devoted, I'm sorry, not developed. The first three chapters of De Ecclesia are little more than a series of extracts from Wycliffe's treatise on the church. What is true of this work is also true of most, most of Huss's other Latin writings. Huss, however, was not a mere copyist. The ideas he got from Wycliffe, he made thoroughly his own. When he quoted Augustine, Bernard, Jerome, and other writers, he mentioned them by name. If he did not mention Wycliffe, he took, uh, when he took from his arguments in an entire paragraphs, a good reason can be assigned for his silence. It was well known that it was Wycliffe's cause, which he was representing, and Wycliffean views that he was defending. And Wycliffe's writings were, were wide open to the eyes of members of the university faculties. He had no secret... He made no secret of following Wycliffe and being willing to die for, for the views Wycliffe taught. He wrote to Richard uh, Wysey, uh, he was thankful that under the power of Christ, Bohemia had received so much good from the blessed land of England. Okay, So I think we see pretty clearly here, where is Huss getting his information? He's a student of Wycliffe. He's going out, he's writing something now in, in Bohemia. And he's basically, I don't want to say just regurgitating, he is using Wycliffe, but he's also you know, uh, making some of his own arguments in, in writing these books. Okay, um, So, definitely Huss is influenced by who? Wycliffe, he's teaching much of the same things that Wycliffe taught, and there's no doubt about the fact that these two men are linked together, and, and when Huss made no bones about the fact of what he was doing. Okay? And everybody in Bohemia and the Czech Republic knew where he was coming from. Okay, Any questions about that? How, how did he keep alive? <laughs> well, he, right now he's in hiding. Okay, And we're going to get to that in the next point on the imprisonment, trial, and execution of Huss. What happens to him? Okay, well, I already told you that he's executed. <laughs> but you'll see how and why, okay? So the entry on John Huss in the Evangelical Dictionary of Theology reports the following regarding the beliefs of the early reformer, okay? <clears throat> it says Huss's sermons attack clerical abuses, especially the immorality and high living of the clergy. His theology was a mixture of evangelical and traditional Roman Catholic doctrines. He preached against the veneration of popes by stressing a strong Christocentric faith that emphasized an individual's responsibility before God. He believed only Christ could forgive sins and expects a coming day of judgment. Okay? However, he still accepted the Roman Catholic doctrine of purgatory, which we said last week, us also, I'm sorry, Wycliffe also maintained at least as far as we know. He believed that both the wine and the bread should be administered in the Lord's Supper and held a view of the elements similar to the doctrine of consubstantiation. So, he's not saying, he does not believe in transubstantiation. He does not believe that they literally become the body and blood of Jesus. Okay? 
he emphasized preaching the word of God to bring about moral and spiritual change in, in listeners' lives and to help read the scriptures. He also revised a Czech translation of the Bible. So again, what is one of the reasons why he's so popular? Because the common man can do what? Read the Bible. Read the Bible. Okay? And he's preaching in what language? The vernacular. Okay? So again, that also in connection with his... Pro, in his uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? His, his teaching the, the, the views of Wycliffe is what's going to get him into trouble. Okay? Next point. As a theologian, Huss restored... Uh, Huss helped restore a biblical version of the church, vision of the church, one that focused on Christ's teachings and example, an example of purity. Moreover, his stress on preaching and the universal priesthood of all believers became hallmarks of the later Protestant Reformation. He also encouraged congregational hymn singing, writing many songs himself. For Czechs, Huss was not only a spiritual leader, but also a focal point of national inspiration in the centuries following his death. Okay? So, Huss is essentially a national hero. Okay? Um, and part of the reason for that is he's going to be martyred, and he's going to be, as, as happens with a lot of martyrs, that's, that's, uh, he becomes a hero as a result. So are there any questions about the teachings of Wycliffe, I'm sorry, the teachings of Huss or Wycliffe's influence on Huss from point number two? Seems like there's a pattern. Like, is it God sanctioned that I know like Luther and he didn't mean to, but he started that war that killed so many people just for the recovery of truth. It seems like it's steered up through the ages, even the Lord, when he walked on the earth, he went to the temple. Is that he, he took the tables and he, he turned them upside down? And well, so it seemed like mankind needs. What is it going everything on? these guys are doing. There was a peasant revolt in England after Wycliffe. Okay, we talked about that last week. How there was a revolt there. There's going to be a revolt and riots here in uh, in, in Bohemia. There's going to be the peasants' revolt in, in Germany after Luther, um, after Luther's teachings become popularized, and when he's in exile. So, what's had? That's why in my book, in my in the uh, the book that I wrote for my <coughs> master's thesis on the Protestant Revolution, that's why I called it a revolution because this this movement literally flipped European society on its head. Because all the power players that had been in power for a thousand years, the Catholic Church are going to be removed, ultimately, from the power. They, what they have never been as powerful as they were before the Reformation as they were before it. Okay? And in fact, it's not until the college... The, the Reformation is well underway before the Pope, in a sense, really even realizes to what extent it's, it, it, it's happened. And so they call the Council of Trent, and they form the Jesuits, the Society of Jesus. And their main goal is to stop, by force of arms if necessary, the, the continuation of Protestantism. And they, 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 they take a, an approach that no matter, they do whatever's necessary, infiltrating the colleges, infiltrating the universities, uh, war, what admissions work, whatever's necessary to, to further the cause of the Catholic Church. Which is why when the, when the New World is discovered, and the, the leading power of the world at the time when the New World is discovered is who? Spain. Spain is staunchly what? Catholic. Catholic. So when the, when the conquistadors come over to the New World, in every one of their, their, their processions, they have Catholic, Catholic bishops and monks in there, and they go all through Central America, South America, Mexico, and they teach Catholic doctrine. They set up Catholic churches. And why is almost all of Central America and South America Roman Catholic? Because that was the influence, and that was a that was done on purpose by the Jesuits to try to combat Protestantism. So anytime you see this thing going on here, Linda, there's almost always because it's not just the recovery of biblical truth. 
the recovery of biblical truth illuminates what's really going on in the secular power structures. And when that happens, it leads to people saying, no, we don't want this anymore. And so you're going to, that's, think about all the religious wars in Europe. Uh, the main argument I actually make in that book is that the, the, the Protestant Revolution starts with Luther and doesn't end until over 100 years later at the end of the Thirty Years' War. Because it's the end of the Thirty Years' War in the 1600s that stops the religious wars of the, on the European continent. And basically says, we're not going to have a Catholic state anymore. And it's the beginning of the idea of nationalism that each of these... Each of these independent states in Europe should all have their own country and their own government, and they don't have to be run by a massive Catholic state or a Holy Roman Empire or anything like that. And so that's the end. There is great political turmoil that results from Luther nailing those things on the door. And then you see the, it's changing, like from the serfs, they're getting a middle class. And there's other forces here too, like the Renaissance. Okay, is going to come out. The, the Industrial Revolution is going to come out, which is going to lead to a, you know, a, a, it's going to the, the, the modern middle class was really the result of the Industrial Revolution. Okay, now we could talk at length about that and all the abuses that came about as a result of the Industrial Revolution, and that's where you get Marx. That's where you get angles. That's where you get these guys who look at the industrial society and they say, well, this isn't right because um, all the guys at the top are getting filthy, dirty, stinking rich off the labor of the guys on the bottom, and the divide is increasing between them. And so what we need to have, the, what's going to happen is there's, history is going to be, what, what, what he says is that, what Marx essentially says is that history has been a struggle between the haves and the have-nots. Right? And what, what socialism and Marxism essentially are teaching is that eventually the have-nots are going to rise up, overthrow these guys, and establish what he calls the dictatorship of the proletariat, where the result is going to be a classless what? Society. Society. Okay? So those are all forces and factors that are eventually going to come out of this entire sweep of, of world history. And this is the stuff we're still struggling with now. Okay? In Wisconsin. Any questions about that? It's interesting how you see God working and He does not let the <coughs> truth go dormant too long. There's always somebody that pops out with the real truth. I think that's a I think that's a good point, and I think if you've seen anything in this class, that should be one of the key observations, you know, that, that you make. That you know, the truth has been suppressed, but it hasn't been stopped. It's always been there. Somebody's always been teaching it. Somebody's always been standing for it. Okay, and it's interesting too. You look at the and it's out of this industrial. You know, other things are happening here too, right? Because. The scientific revolution comes along and then they say what? Well, the only thing that you can really know for sure is things that you can prove by science. And so the old ways of doing things where people just accepted church doctrine, just accepted the Bible, or, or accepted you know old Greek explanations for things are going to be challenged, which is going to lead to the Enlightenment, which is going to lead to the age of reason, and all in the modern world, and now you know all the stuff that we struggle with now. And all through that, you're going to have the, God's Word being recovered at, at various times in history to, to varying degrees, but it's always going to be there. Does this make sense to you? Any questions or comments about that? You know, look, if, if you haven't taken... If you haven't read... Most of you probably had one world history class in high school, right? And you probably remember this much from it. Okay? If you haven't read a world history book, I, I recommend that you just get one and read it. And read it from the perspective of what you believe as a believer. And you can it'll give you a lot of insight into what's happened and why, and possibly some insights into where things are going. The Bible gives you insight into that, right? You know things are getting worse or getting better. They're getting worse. Okay? But this, you know, so 
just real quick while I'm thinking about this, Darwin explained the beginning of everything without who? God. Marx explained the end without God. That's why there's almost always a connection in someone's ideology between socialism and evolution. Because they both are systems of thought that are predicated on the idea that God does not exist. One explains the beginning without God, the other one explains the ending without God. Okay. Now look at what's going on right now in modern America. Can you teach creationism or intelligent design? No. no. Because of separation of church and state and all this other stuff. Okay? Can't do it. So, but can you teach that? Of course. Can you teach evolution? Mm -hmm. And so the result is a worldview that has nothing to do with who? The beginning, the ending can all be explained without God in the scripture. And as a result, modern man has no need for God. Now that's just my pontifications, I suppose, <laughs> but hopefully they're helpful to you. Anyway, we got to move on here. We're not going to finish. Any, any other questions or comments about that, Linda? No, I'm, yeah, I, oh yeah, I could go on for a long time. I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Imprisonment, trial, and execution of Huss. In 1415, an imperial herald found Huss. Because remember, he's been in hiding. They find him. Okay? And asked him to defend himself at a church council at the German city of Constance. The Holy Roman Empire, Emperor promised to protect Huss on the way to the council and from the council. Huss accepted his offer. Unfortunately, the cardinal did not keep the Holy, Rem Holy Roman Emperor's offer, and Huss was imprisoned in the castle of Constance. I'm sorry, who's the Holy Roman Empire? It's not the Pope. It's not the Pope, it's the, it's the Emperor, it's the secular authority. Okay. It's the King, the Emperor. The King, okay. Shelley paints a similar picture. The Council of Constance was now fast approaching, and Huss yielded to the urging of, the, of Emperor uh, Sigismund and agreed to appear at the Council. He had hopes of presenting his views to the assembled authorities, but upon arrival he found himself instead a victim of the Inquisition. Okay? Arriving in Constance, here's what happened. Arriving in Constance before the emperor, so he made a mistake. He got there before the emperor did. So when that happened, was there any secular authority to tell the, the, the archbishop not to arrest him? So he's arrested here, okay? Arriving in Constance before the emperor, Huss was immediately brought before the Pope, uh, John the Twenty-Third, for examination. A long list of charges were brought against him, and he refused to retract them. Consequently, he was thrown into prison, despite the promise of safe conduct, uh, I should say, by the emperor. Lord, or loud complaints were sent to the emperor from Bohemia. He received the first... He received the first uh, imitation of the imprisonment of Huss with indignation and threatened to break open the prison. But on reaching Constance, he was piled with arguments from the canon law, urging the civil power did not extend to the protection of heretics, and the treacherous priests absolved him from all responsibility. Oh, well, we absolve you. You're not responsible. We, we erase your guilt in this matter. Okay, So they're basically theologically blackmailing him. He now allowed the enemies of Huss to take their course. In the gloom of a loathsome dungeon, uh, without a breath of fresh air, and harassed by priests and monks, the reformer became very ill. In the first, in the first movement against Huss, the Archbishop of Prague instituted a violent search for the translations of Wycliffe's writings, and having collected about 200 volumes, many of them richly bound and decorated with precious ornaments, he caused them to be publicly burnt in the marketplace of Prague. Okay? Much was said much was said as to the identity of the doctrines of Huss with those of Wycliffe, which the council condemned as heretical under 45 propositions, 
and declared that his bones should be taken out of their grave and burned, Huss was charged with being infected with the leprosy of the Waldensians. Now you remember them? Those were those guys from the Piedmont, from the Alpine regions of, of France and Italy and so forth. They accuse Huss of being in what? A Waldensian. So they, they collect the stuff of Wycliffe, they burn it, they put they, they read 45 propositions against them, okay? The council <coughs> should say bent on the destruction of Huss would willingly have avoided the scandal of public uh, of public examination. Certain passages, uh, certain passages which his enemies had extracted from his writings, were thought sufficient for the condemnation. With a, with, it should say, without a public hearing. Accordingly, he was continually harassed and persecuted in his cell by private visits, urging him to retract or confess. His faithful friend John of Clum, with other Bohemian noblemen, requested the emperor to interfere. And with his assistance, the objections of the fathers were defected, and a public trial was obtained. So they, they, they say, oh, well, we can, he's guilty just because of what he says in these articles or these writings or whatever. We don't need to have a public hearing. Well, there's at least enough pressure put on the emperor to say, no, we need to have a public hearing. So they call a public, uh, a public trial or, or a hearing for Huss. On the 5th of June, 1455, John Huss was brought in chains to the great senate of Christendom. The charges against him were read when he proposed to maintain his doctrines by authority of the scriptures and the, te and the testimony of the fathers. His voice was drowned out by, the, by a tumult of contempt and derision. So there's almost a, essentially a riot here. Two days later, he was brought up again. This time, the presence of the emperor. This time, in the presence of the emperor, to preserve order. Despite being exhausted due to illness and enfeebled by his long confinement, Huss refused to bend before the violence of his, of his persecutors. He answered with great calmness and dignity, I will not retract unless you can prove what I have said is contrary to the word of God, was his usual reply. He says, if you can prove me wrong from Scripture, I'll what? I'll retract. I'll confess. I'll take it back. Do they have any intention of proving him wrong from Scripture? No. The following... I'm sorry, go ahead. When charged with having preached Wycliffe doctrines, he admitted that he had said Wycliffe was a true believer, that his soul was now in heaven, and that he could not wish his own soul more safe than Wycliffe's. And basically when he says that, they laugh at him. They call him a fool and they laugh at him because Wycliffe was a heretic and kicked out of the church. Okay? So they basically say, you're a moron. There's no way that Wycliffe's in heaven because he didn't die in the favor of this body, basically is what they say to him. Um, the following day, Huss stood a third time before the council. Thirty-nine propositions were produced and read, alleging errors which he had advanced in his writings, his preachings, and his private conversations. Huss, like most reformers, held the doctrine of salvation by grace without works. He affirmed that none were members of the true Church of Christ, whether uh, whatever their uh, dignity, whether popes or cardinals, if they were ungodly. The pontiff who lives... Not the life of St. Peter is no vicar of Christ, but the forerunner of the Antichrist. Woo. Now you can see why they want to kill him. Okay. <laughs> the proposition treated, uh, treated chiefly of two things. So there's essentially two things. Number one, the false theology of Rome. Huss had denounced the popish doctrine of salvation by works in the many ways which the church prescribes. Number two, the false ecclesiastical system of the popery with its, with its glaring abuses. These he exposed and condemned with the most unsparing terms. So there's two things I'm essentially mad at him about. Denying salvation by works and the sacramental sacerdotalism of the church and also saying that the, the whole papal system is a sham, it's run by sinners, and it doesn't mean anything. Okay? So those are, of all the charges brought against him, those are the two fundamental ones that they're really mad at him about. Which essentially encapsulate all the other points that he had to make. Okay? These anti-Catholic doctrines aside, this is interesting, his condemnation seems to have stemmed from his assertion that no office, priest, or king availed in God's sight if the king or priest lived in mortal sin. 
Okay? When pressed on this point, Huss said, A king in mortal sin is no king before God, thereby sealing his wife. Now why does that seal his fate? Because the emperor is standing there saying, Are you kidding me? <laughs> and after all, we've already studied the Inquisition. Who, had the, who was it that was going to have to put him to death? The king, because the church authorities were not allowed to do it. So they would hold the trial and so forth, and then they turn him over to the secular authority for execution. Okay. So when he says that statement, a king, a king in mortal sin is no king before God, he's basically sealing his fate because there's no way the emperor isn't going to execute him now after he basically says he's not a real king. So does the emperor have a little conscience here about not protecting us and all the stuff that he promised he would do and then allowing him to be tortured and you know, questioned and all the stuff that was going on. So Huss basically he doesn't he goes right after the king in, in, in making these these statements. What is moral sin? I mean, what is, is he's living in luxury? Is Catholics make a distinction between mortal and venial sin. Um, a venial sin is like a little white lie, something like that. A mortal sin would be something like murder. Um, some gross, heinous type type of act. Immorality. And... Yeah. So after removing Huss from the court, Emperor Sig Sigmund uh, says, this is what he says, you have heard the charges against Huss. Some confessed by himself, some provided by trustworthy witnesses, which I would say, yeah, right. <laughs> In my judgment, each of these crimes is deserving of death. If he does not forswear all his heirs, he must be burned. The evil must be extirpated, root and branch. If any of his partisans are inconstant, they must proceed against with utmost severity, especially his disciple Jerome of Prague. After this mockery of a trial and the final audience, he was left in prison for nearly a month. So they leave him in prison for another month. During this time, persons of the highest rank visited him and treated him to observe the effects uh, which were imputed to him. It was hoped that through increasing bodily infirmity and private uh, importunity, uh, importunity, he might be overcome. So they leave him in prison for another month and subject him to the worst type of treatment and so forth, hoping that he's just going to do what? Die. Die. Or confess. Okay? Because they really don't want to do what? They don't want to execute him publicly because they know if they do, are they going to have a riot on their hands? Okay? There's some pictures of it there. So on July 6, 1415... The cardinals drew demons on a paper hat, jammed it on Huss's head. Now, I had to make a decision here about how much stuff I was going to put in the notes. But if you want to read Miller, Andrew Miller in Miller's Church History goes through a lot of detail about what they actually did to him. But they brought him up and they dressed him in his whole priestly garb, basically. And then they went through a whole process where they mocked him, defrocked him, okay, stripped him of all of his... Um, all of his position within the church in a mocking fashion, and they jam this, you can see it in this picture here, they jam this, this paper um, hat on him with demons drawn on it, and they basically are calling him Satan. Is essentially what they're doing. Okay, So I'm going to read the rest of that quote. On July 6, 1415, the cardinals drew demons on a paper hat and jammed it on Huss's head. The church could not kill a heretic, only the government could undertake that task. So the cardinals handed Huss over to the king's soldiers. As soldiers tied him to a pole and prepared to burn him alive, Huss prayed, Lord Jesus, please have mercy on my enemies, and he died singing psalms. And right before they threw the torches on the fire, they said, you sure you don't want to retract? You sure you don't want to confess? And according to some accounts, he actually died of the smoke inhalation 
before he burned alive. Okay? I don't know if you can prove that or not, but I read a few things that seem to make that suggestion that he was probably dead before the fire actually got to him. I mean, you've got to remember, has this guy been basically beat to a pulp and spent who knows how long in a dungeon and so, and so forth? He probably was not in very good shape to begin with, and he's, he's, he's officially, he's burned at the stake. Okay, is the official, would be the official cause of death. Um, and that's what you see there in the picture. All right, any questions about any of that before we get to the last point? This was all done in public? Oh, yeah. And what, hap what happens after this? So for a while, all heck breaks loose in Bohemia over this. Okay, because again, is he a national hero? Now, how did not, I mean, he just preached what White did. He didn't do the Bible or anything. He, didn't he was involved in, in a translation of the Bible into Czech. Oh, okay. Okay. Not, but he's not, the reason, he's not as instrumental in that whole process as Wycliffe was for the English Bible. Right, because it's Wycliffe and then... Wycliffe and then Tyndale would be the second one. The Bohemian Brother. The burning of Huss did not end the movement, of which he had been the leader. Indeed, it furthered it. Huss became a national hero. While he was in prison in Constance, some of his followers began giving the cup in the communion to the laity. House approved. So they strip all that stuff away from the clergy. There's no distinction anymore amongst the followers of Huss between clergy and laity. Okay. In Bohemia, those who followed Wycliffe and Huss, uh, basically they, they fall into two camps. Okay. You have one more aristocratic and that group be, uh, began or became in the communion they gave both the bread and the wine to the laity, wished for the free preaching of the gospel and a moral clergy that stood against those practices of the Catholic Church, which they regarded as forbidden by the Bible. Then you have a second group, which is more of a grassroots commoners, are, are mostly more involved in the second group, okay, who took their name from the chief fortress which they held. No, uh, wait, uh, sorry. The other Toberites, who took their name from the chief fortress, who were led by the blind general uh, Ziska, were from the humbler ranks of society and went on the principle of rejecting everything which they could not find expressly warranted in the law of God as set forth in the Bible. Okay? These followers of Huss. That's a repeat. Man. These followers of Huss struggled against the Roman Catholic Church and the German Empire until several wars reduced their numbers and in, number and influence. Despite the best efforts of the papacy to bring an end to the Bohemian heresy, an independent church survived, known as the uh, Unitus uh, frat Fraterum, a, or Unity of Brotherhood. Until the coming of Luther, it remained a root in dry ground. Lorette adds that the uh, Unitus Fraterum, or Bohemian Brethren, appeared about the middle of the 15th century and seems to have been made up of elements of both the group, those, uh, those, those two groups there, and the Waldensians. Okay? So these guys are the forerunners of... Basically, Luther in the German area surrounding Bohemia. Lee? Pastor, before you go, I'd like to just, uh, it's hard for me to contain myself here. I had the, I had the privilege of uh, being in St. Giles Church, which was the church of Huss. Across the street was his home, and uh, it stands today, frankly, as a model. Uh, a memorial of the Roman Catholic's superiority or, or defeat of Huss. Across, uh, right next door to his house, well, the, the home today is a museum. But right next door to it, uh, Dion Moody was so moved by that, he bought the property. And in the 1850s, 
And he built and paid for a church there, which is still operated by the Wycliffe Bible translators. And I had the privilege of preaching there for almost a week. Really? There and, uh, but I'm telling you, the Roman church still thumbs their nose, and they still would like to have you remember that this was John Huss's church. But, uh, in fact, that was in our lifetime that the Roman the Pope actually visited that church and preached from Huss's pulpit. What a musical. It's called St. Giles. If you want to look it up, St. Giles okay. is the name of the church. <coughs> well, I, of course, don't have a neat story like that. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's cool. And, yeah, that would be a massive insult for them to preach from that pulpit. That'd be... That's, but see, everything they do is calculated. They know what they're doing. Okay, uh, my, Mike. Mike laughs, uh, was laughing kind of under his breath a few weeks ago about the idea that the church has changed its colors. Uh, when we were kind of talking about that, I don't. You know, look. You should not think for a second that if that church thought that it could reassert it, the same power and authority that they had before the Reformation, that they wouldn't do it in a second. Okay, they have not changed their fundamental opinions about any of that stuff. All right, it's just that's just the way it is. Church history has borne it out. Current church doctrine, practice, and teaching bears it out. All right. So here's what we're going to do next week. I'm not going to be here. I believe Paul is planning some sort of a study during this hour at nine o'clock as normal. Okay. I don't think it's going to be a church history study, but it's going to be a study on something. I don't know what, but he said he was going to have class. So there will be class next week at 9 o'clock. When we get back, the 10th of April, I'm going to teach a lesson on the Renaissance. Then after we're done with the Renaissance, we're going to take the rest of April and May to talk about the Reformation. And then we're probably going to stop at that. I'm hoping that you will say to me that you have enjoyed this enough to continue next school year to bring it all the way up through where we're at today. That was my initial goal when we started, and I knew when, I knew when we started that I wasn't going to be able to do all of it in one, in one school year with only teaching an hour one time a week. Okay, So be thinking about that. If you say if you say not to, I might say tough knobs. I'm going to do it anyway, <laughs> uh, just because I want to do it. But uh, that's kind of that's kind of the plan. And then we're going to finish we're going to finish this off. And we're uh, at the end. I told you about this last time. We're going to have a movie night, uh, probably sometime in early June, uh, where we'll come in and we'll watch uh, the Luther movie in the auditorium. For those of you that are interested, and anybody else who wants to come. When are you going to publish your master's thesis? <coughs> what? On the history you were just mentioned. I already did. It's in the bookstore. The Protestant Revolution and the Thirty Years' War. Whoa, I didn't see it. It's in the, the bookstore. Okay, any, any other questions or comments? Yeah. It seems odd that uh, both Wycliffe and Huss hung on to the concept of purgatory. Have you got any explanation for that? The only explanation I have for that is kind of what I said last week, that when you talk about recovery of truth, another thing that we seem to see is that a generation will come on and they'll, they'll, they'll get some things, but they'll only get so far. They'll teach the things that they get, then the next generation will says, okay, we got that, and then they, they go a little further and they go a little further until eventually, you know, you have... I don't know if you want to call it. I, I hesitate to say a full recovery because that would imply that we know everything there is to know, which I don't believe we do. But each generation kind of goes a little bit further, and you even see that with within the grace the grace movement where that has definitely happened. Okay, um, so that would be my explanation. Purgatory was in the apocrypha. Yeah, the, the, the apocryphal books do teach. But you can't find it in a solus bell. How right? about in the Latin uh, translation of the Bible? Would there have been anything in there that might have been interpreted as being uh, purgatory? You know, I don't know. Do you? I talked about purgatory last year in the series we did on eternal punishment, and the last message in that series was called the Halls of Heresy, and I talked about purgatory in that series. It's on the internet if you want to look at the notes.
you need to, you need to search online messages and go to the year 2010, and then you'll find it. Okay? All right, thanks for your attention.